Yeah, I'll probably now be less able to be reactive and seeing like what is asked in the HackMDN chat, but please do not hesitate to interrupt me. And I guess also, Jarno, you can DJ me yeah, questions if they come the up. Yeah, I will follow the chat and HackMD and try to answer and bring up anything yeah. that is especially interesting. Yeah, perfect. So uh, can you see my empty notebook now? Oh, I don't okay. see reactions. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so uh, now we are going to talk about multiple dispatch, which is uh, actually one of the things that makes Julia really Julia. So one of the cool uh, things of Julia. And uh, here we are just giving like a basic uh, introduction. If you want to know more, there was a talk from uh, Julia Con 2019 called uh, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Multiple Dispatch from uh, Stefan Karpinski, the creator of Julia. You can find that on YouTube. And if you want to know more, uh, you can uh, well look at it and uh, to know like uh, how multiple dispatch works internally and uh, why it's very powerful. But uh, now to uh, understand uh, what it means to have multiple dispatch, let's take an example. So uh, suppose uh, I want uh, to define a function, let's call it f of x, which is uh, say, two times x, for example, okay? Simple function. Oh, this shouldn't take that long. Okay, good. So uh, as we said before, this function, uh, Julia uses stack typing, which means that now if I just say x, this x can be any method, and then uh, when I, it can be any type, and then when I call this function with something, something for example, f of one, then it will just run the code and see, okay, now here I have this star operator. Is it defined for an integer? And if it is, it will work. So if this one like uh, behaves like an object which has this uh, star operator, it will work. But uh, sometimes uh, we may want uh, to have uh, different behaviors for different types. For example, maybe I want to define a function, my func which uh, behaves uh, differently for, uh, for example, integers and for floats. And that way I can achieve this flexible behavior using uh, multiple methods of the same function. So what it means is that now I can do my func x of uh, say an integer. And I want that this function with an integer will uh, add one, for example, like this. Now, if I call my func of one, it works. If I do my func of 1.0, it throws an error. It says no method matching my func called with a float. Closest candidates are my func integer. So what does it mean? This means that my func is only defined with uh, inputs of type integer. And uh, there's no definition of the function when the input is type float. And uh, this uh, instance of a function with a specific type, it's called a method. So now we say that my func has a method which works with integers. And uh, if I want, now I can add more methods. For example, I can do my func of uh, x of type float 64, for example. And uh, say, if I call it with a float, I want to multiply by two. Doesn't really make sense, but uh, if now I do methods, uh, my func, now it says that uh, now I have, uh, ah, sorry. So there's this uh, function called methods, uh, which take, takes as input the name of the function, and it will list uh, the methods associated with that function name. So now it's saying that with the, my func name, there are two methods associated. One method defined with integers and one method defined with floats. Okay. And so in this way, I can define different behaviors for integers and floats. So now if I do my func of one, uh, uh, let's say my func of two, it prints a three because for integers, it's defined as x plus one. But if I do my func of uh, 2.0, for example, so now this is a float, I get four. 
because now it's calling uh, this uh, other method uh, defined for floats. Okay. And uh, now let's uh, have a quick poll uh, quickly. So suppose now I define uh, my func of x, uh, which is just a number. And uh, in that case, uh, it just returns x. Okay. Now I do methods of uh, my func. And now see, I have uh, three methods. One method defined when the input is integer, one method defined when the input is a float, and one method defined when the input is a number. Okay. And now if I call uh, my func of, uh, say, two, uh, what do you think it, what do you think will the output be? So now two is an integer, but it's also a number. So what do you think will happen now? Uh, can you, I don't know, uh, put a green mark if you think it will print four and uh, so uh, green reaction prints four and uh, red reaction prints two. What do you think will happen? Oh, maybe I spoiled it uh, a little now. Uh, oh, now I spoiled even more. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so there was a comment in the chat that uh, maybe error, uh, and that would also have been like a like guess like good like guess. And uh, so now it prints a three because what it does is that if there are multiple methods, it uh, chooses the most specific. So now this two is. Uh, both an integer and a, a number, but integer is uh, a more specific type. So it's said to be a subtype of number. So every integer is also a number. So this method is more specific and hence it picks the more specific method. Okay. Yeah, and uh, sorry, I accidentally pressed the enter and uh, spoiled the fun for everyone. Oh, oh, wait. oh yeah, it was also this method, yeah, this one. So with integer. So with integer is defined as x plus one. And so, so it could used HackMD to do the poll, but maybe next time. Yeah, true. If you have yeah. more than three options. Yeah, true, sorry. Yeah, it didn't come to my mind. But yeah. And now if you want to know which method it calls, I can, I'll, We'll maybe talk later about what this uh, at which means. For now, I think it's at a magic word. And if I type at which, uh, and then I call the function, it will tell me which method it's using. So now it's telling me that it's using the method with uh, integer. OK? Great. Uh, but the power, so far, we have used only like one single uh, input. That's uh, not uh, like maybe very exciting, but the power, powerful thing of multiple dispatch is that uh, I can use it also with uh, multiple inputs. So suppose uh, uh, now I have, uh, I want to uh, define a function, uh, my func, uh, so uh, a function which we will call uh, uh, add, for example, okay? And what do I want this add to do? I want that add can uh, sum two uh, numbers or concatenate two strings, okay? So I want to define a function called add, which works uh, both with numbers and with the strings. And if it's called with numbers, it will uh, sum those. And if it's called with uh, strings, uh, it will concatenate uh, those uh, two strings. And how can we do it? Well, we can do add, uh, and the first input uh, we specify that must be a number, and uh, the second input must be a number. And now we say that uh, when I call the function out uh, with uh, two numbers, then uh, it will uh, return the sum x plus y. If uh, I call the function add with uh, two strings, uh, string, 
Then I will concatenate the string and the string concatenation is done in Julia with this star operator, with the multiple operator, okay? Now we have defined the function and it says that it has two methods. We can verify methods add. We have a method with number and number and a method with a string and string. And uh, now uh, what we can do is uh, we can do add one, two, it will return a three and add hello world. And it will concatenate the strings. And this is very cool because the same function will behave differently depending on the type of the input it's called with. And that's like a very powerful feature of Julia because if this is done smartly, is uh, uh, wouldn't that uh, essentially be polymorphism? Uh, kind of, but not quite. I'm not expert in programming language theory, but uh, my, well, it's kind of polymorphism, but polymorphism is a concept associated with object-oriented programming. So you have a class and then uh, you can associate like uh, the behavior with uh, different uh, classes, like if you have yeah, subclasses. Um... I was planning to comment on this. So, I mean, this is, um, I mean, what happens in object-oriented languages is called dynamic dispatch. So, um, of course, the word the word multiple dispatch is a sort of, I mean, it comes from the same, or it, it, it's sort of trying to yeah. um, tell you that it's the same idea as multiple, uh, as dynamic dispatch. So, dynamic dispatch will, check um we'll check the type of the first argument which is the when you say object dot method um it the first argument is the object it will check the type of the first argument and based on that decide which function which method to run um in polymorphism um essentially so poly, what polymorphism as to that is runtime type inspection so you don't necessarily need to know the type of the object when uh, the code is being compiled. Yeah. Um, if, you're, if you're familiar with a uh, language like Python, then that isn't really a huge difference because it's not compiled anyway, so that all the types are runtime. But in C++, for example, um, the difference between a runtime type and a compile time type is a, a big deal. Yeah. And that's um, also... So yeah, so what dynamic um, dispatch does is essentially the same thing, but um, it checks all the variable types, all the parameter types, not just the first one. Yeah. And of course, and the syntax is very different. Yeah, and also the powerful thing of Julia, which is, I guess, also how it differs from this uh, like object-oriented stylish polymorphism is that now when I call this function, I'm giving two strings. And now uh, when Julia compiles the code, it knows indeed that compile time that these are strings. So it can actually choose the method before the computation at compile time. It can already choose uh, what method to use at compile time. And that's also like one of the strong reasons why Julia is like efficient. Because if you do things smartly so that uh, you know the type of your variables at each step, then Julia can choose the, method, the methods to call already at compile time. And that's where like the speed comes from. So that also explains the use of the word method here. Yeah. So in uh, object-oriented languages, classes have methods, and then those methods can be called uh, with objects. Um, and in Julia, it, it may seem a bit weird that functions have methods. But um, if you think of it as being, instead of uh, belonging to a class or being um, depending on the object, it, it depends on all the variables in uh, all the parameters in the function. So um, it kind of makes sense then, it doesn't make sense to assign them to the first parameter or any of the parameters, um, but it does make sense then, I mean, you have to have some place to assign it. So it does make sense to assign the methods to the function. Um, so it, it's kind of, that, that's why we use the same word, the same, the word method. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So now I have defined this method for two numbers and for two strings. Uh, for example, I may want to define like uh, mixed combinations, like uh, number and the string. So now if I call it like this, add the one high, 
it throws an error because it says there's no method matching this uh, function called with an integer and a string. The options are like a number and number or string and string. But uh, I can also define this method if I want. So for example, I can do add of x when is a number and y when is a string. And this will do the, I mean, I can decide what it will do, but I could maybe like interpolate inside the same strings so something like this. And now if I do add one high, it will concatenate. So it will interpolate the values inside this string and return a string. Okay. Uh, I should also define uh, the symmetric if I want. So I can do add of x when is uh, a string and y when is a number. And in this case, it will give, uh, I mean, I can decide we do just x, y. Okay. And this will do it. So add high three. Yeah. So the key idea is that uh, in Julia, you can associate uh, several methods uh, with the same function name. And uh, you can use these uh, to specify the different behavior of the function depending on the type of the input. So the same function add, you can define different behaviors for uh, when the input is number, when the input is string. And if you want to see the list of methods, you can do methods and the function name, and it will print everything. So why? It will print the list of methods. And let's take, for example, let's have a look and how is the plus, the Julia built-in plus defined. Let's do method plus, oh, methods plus. And you can see it has 190 methods defined. So we have a, a well, generic one where they're both like, a, integer, unside integers of the same type, a method for when one is unside integer, one is big int. The, it doesn't matter this. The important thing is that uh, uh, defining different methods for different uh, scenarios. So, so a method for addition when they're both unside integers, a method for addition when one is unside integer and one is floating point allows you to have like optimized code for each of the different, each one of the different scenarios. So I can use an optimized code for the case when they're both unside integers, an optimized code for the case when they're both floating point, an optimized code when one is floating point and one is integer. And uh, doing this, uh, since uh, I know if I know the types at compile time, so if uh, I know the type of the variables when I'm typing, then the Julia compiler will be able to decide already before computation what uh, uh, method to pick. And this will allow to produce very optimized code. Yes. Uh, then there was this uh, question in the chat before about the example with update. So uh, someone had, uh, so the idea is that once you define a method, you can uh, overload it if you, you can redefine it, but you cannot delay it. So if I define f of x, y just like this to be uh, okay let's no let's do like f of x uh, integer y integer to be x plus y okay uh, I, I define the function it works f12 okay then if i change my mind i say wait a second i don't want it to work for all integers i want it to work only for uh, unside integers for example so i I think I redefine it and I do fx of unsigned, y of unsigned equal x plus y. So now if I'm not like familiar with Julia, I think, okay, first I had defined to work with uh, both with integers. Now I'm defining to work with the unsigned integers. I think it works. Uh, but then if I do f of minus one minus two, it still computes it. And the re reason for this is that if I do methods f, okay, I had this one, which I had from the previous example, but now I see that when I redefine, I didn't replace it. I added the new method to the previous one. So once I have defined the method, when x and y are both integers, I cannot get rid of that, except by killing the REPL, the Julia session is starting again. Um, so, uh, I can redefine it if x is integer y integer 
And now I can say that this is x minus y, for example, or I can have it through an error if I want. That will do f minus one minus two, should be the difference. But I cannot get rid of if I cannot delete it. So there's some conversation going on in the in the chat. I think it's it's better to um, yeah. bring it up um, because this is um, kind of a this is a very um, important topic for yeah. why Julia is fast yeah. and how it works. Um, also, yeah. So the first so, question yeah. is indeed great. Um, well, I don't. So, um, because we talk about a compiler and an interpreter. So, mm -hmm. in Julia, whenever you run a function, that function is first compiled and then it's run. Um, if you run it for a sec, of course, yeah. If you run it for a second time with the same parameter, same types of parameters, then it doesn't get compiled again, of course. Um, it just it uses that compiled version. Yeah. But so basically in Julia, whenever you are inside a function that will be compiled code. So, and it's compiled with um, LLVM, which um, often is used to compile C and C++ code. So it is uh, basically equally, um, equally fast as C code. Yeah. Um, but that only happens when you're inside a function. So the basic compilation unit, um, so in C, for example, it's a file. A one file is always compiled into one um, sort of uh, binary code file. Um, in Julia, it's always a function. So functions are always compiled. Whenever you're inside a function, um, it is compiled. And um, it always comp compiles basically one function at a time. Of course, if you are calling a function from inside a function, also that function gets compiled. So, um, but the, the basic compilation unit is one function. Yeah. So if you want something to be fast, you need to put it in a function. Yeah, that's a common like mistake when people start to Julia that to use global variables and don't put their things inside functions. But yeah, uh, then there was other questions. Um, so it yeah. compiles automatically. And if you can compile an entire script. So I tried to also answer that second, uh, yeah. well, that last question. So yeah, so you mean like, the answer is no, it will compi compile the, fu uh, the functions. Yeah, so if the question is like, uh, can you get an executable, like an image, executable <laughs> images from the file? Uh, it's not a super easy. There is a package to do it called the uh, package builder, I think. So in principle, there's a way to do it, but it's not uh, exactly super easy. Or maybe it's easy and, and I just cannot yeah. do it. But Well, but um, I mean, that's not really, yeah, that's not exactly the right way. It's not wrong to yeah. create an executable, but like in Python, that's not really the right way. To yeah, it's it. not the Julia way. Yeah, uh, one last thing I wanted to mention about this like uh, topic before we move to exercise is that the common misconception when people start to Julia is that they think that uh, they should always put like a ty like a type annotations to make the code fast. So people may think that if I just write F, X, Y, well, let's use a different name now, G, X, Y of, uh, uh, explain something like this. People when start, get started with Julia think that if I don't specify the type here, then the compiler will not know the type and will not be as efficient as it could be. That's actually not true. So if uh, I define a function like this, and then I call g one two, now that the Julia sees that this is an integer and this is an integer, it can already figure out by itself that this uh, is like uh, to call this with integer and integer. So it, and when it called this plus, uh, it knows that this plus is called with integer and integer. So adding uh, here the specification integer and integer, it doesn't really make your code faster. That can be used to res restrict the behavior if you want that it doesn't work with uh, non integers. But uh, putting all the annotations, uh, just thinking that will make it faster, it actually doesn't make faster. Annotations are used to specify different behaviors. What yes. about multiplication science? So then the function, the compiler doesn't know in advance uh, what X and Y, are they integers or string? Uh, you mean like uh, if I define the function as uh, this or? Yes, so as, uh, as much as I know now, the multiplication sign uh, means as well concatenation of strings. Uh, no, no, I mean, 
This means concatenation if it's cold. So this has different methods. And if it's cold with the strings, it means concatenation. So the method uh, multiplication string string means concatenation. But if it's called with integers, it means multiplication. And if I just do G12, now it knows this is an integer, this is an integer. Now I want the star with integer, integer. And under the hood is implemented as multiplication. So it knows it. Uh, so the Julia uh, compiles the function during the call of this function, not uh, definition. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, yeah. It, com it is compiled when it's called and yeah, for the it's types it's called with. Yes, so thank you. Okay, so uh, are there other questions or comments? Or otherwise, I think we could uh, have uh, an exercise about this and then move on to the next notebook. So uh, the way we split the second half of the day after lunch break was that we have 40 minute sections, which uh, 40 minutes is now gone. Yeah. Um, I think we do need one more 10 minute break. Okay, so uh, let's have uh, maybe a- Or maybe a five minute break because then it's only 40 minutes and it's an exercise. Yeah. Okay, so let's um, have a maybe small exercise and then a break. What do you think? Yeah, that's fine. So um, okay. give a thumbs down um, as a reaction if you want the 10 minute break. Okay, I think we're fine. Okay. So nobody gave me thumbs down. Okay, so um, as an exercise, I think, uh, for example, we could uh, uh, play uh, uh, rock, paper, scissors, okay? So uh, I, I assume everybody knows the rules of uh, rock, paper, scissors. So what I'm doing now, I'm defining three types, a stroke, the rock, and just like these, so without like parameters, struct uh, paper and struct uh, scissors. Scissors. Okay. So now I have three types rock, paper, scissors. And now I can create a rock. So this is an object of type rock, a paper, and a scissor. Oh, scissors, I had written now. Let's go with the scissors then for now. So uh, the exercise is uh, write the function play x, y, which, uh, uh, well, implements the game. So like uh, if uh, the first is uh, rock and uh, the second is paper, paper wins rock, so should print play x, y, so uh, which uh, prints uh, which uh, one wins. For example, uh, play uh, of uh, rock and the paper should return second wins. And I mean, you don't need to do all the different cases but just to get a taste, play of uh, uh, rock, rock could play print for example, something like this. So maybe 10 minutes for this. I think it's appropriate and then we can have a break maybe. Okay, so I guess we can uh, have uh, a quick sketch of the solution. Yeah, all right. yeah. so uh, the idea is that uh, uh, now I define different methods depending on the type of the input. So, so like if the first is of type uh, rock and the second is of type uh, paper, then I will print uh, uh, second uh, wins. And also note that uh, if I don't need to use the inputs uh, like this, I could write like this, when the input is X of type rock and uh, Y of type paper. If uh, I don't do anything with these variables, I can just like uh, leave those unnamed and say that when the, imp the first input is of type rock and the second is of type paper, print uh, return the string, the second wins. 
when uh, what do we have rock and uh, rock tie play uh, paper scissors uh, second wins and for example play paper rock first wins for example now I can say I have these four methods to find and I can play. Play, uh, rock, paper. Second wins. Play, paper, uh, scissors, for example. And ah, I didn't define that one. Okay, what, what did I define? No, I defined that. Ah, oh, it's called scissor. Paper, scissor, second wins. Play, uh, rock, rock, second wins. Uh, tie now. So, for example, if I had to find all the methods, I could also uh, like uh, create a function that generates those randomly, and so it would be like a real game instead of just typing the offset the signs. Uh, do you have questions about multiple dispatch and about uh, these methods, like methods functions? Yes. If you try to summarize the highlight methods. Uh, list all methods associated with a given function name and this which magical word prints which method is used. Then if multiple methods are possible, for example, if I had to find a method with number and with integer, and if I code with an integer, it's both an integer and a number. So if multiple methods are possible, the most specific is picked. I guess that's like the way of summarizing the highlights of the lesson. So should we now have a 10 minutes break or what do you think, Jarno? How should we proceed? Um, I think five minutes. Yeah, sounds good. So, not too exact. Um, in three minutes, though, um, could you or I can I can also um show the uh, epidemic simulation example. No, oh, yeah. yeah. If it takes more than three minutes, then we'll uh, move the break by one minute. Yeah. So you mean Just the epidemic? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the at the... the towards the end, right before the fruit bowl, extra exercise. Yeah. Um, yeah, just to have it in the repository that, uh, or um, I mean, that we have done it. Oh yeah, that's. And yeah. it's kind of fun. Also, you can redefine how things are printed, how your own types are printed. Yeah. Uh, can you see the notebook now? I can see your untitled notebook. Oh. I mean, it, it is still. It is better if you type it out. I think. Okay. Yeah. Just generally. Um, not too long. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So to uh, come back to this, like um, general, like epidemic modeling uh, storyline that we have in this uh, lesson. Uh, before we have the oh, I would need to redefine the plans. I need to define a plan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's see, do I have it now? Okay. I can like copy that part and then paste. Yeah, so that's what was done before. Yeah, and the uh, well, the plan type itself. Yeah. Okay, so that's what we had done before, and now uh, if I create a plant, like uh, I call it uh, uninfected and uh, time instant zero, it creates it, and it's by default printed uh, this way. So it's simply the name of the type, and then the list of the values for the attributes. So status is uninfected. It prints uninfected. Infection time is zero, it's print as zero. Uh, that's uh, still like a decently readable. So you could understand, but in general, when you have custom types, it gets pretty fast, like uh, difficult to read. So what you want to do is that you want to define a like a pretty printing, like a custom printing. And the way to do it is to overload the method show 
which is this uh, Julia like built-in function to like print the things in the REPL in the terminal. And uh, you want to overload that function and define a method with uh, your specific type. So you want to tell uh, Julia how the method show should behave when the input is an object of type plant. So let's do it. And uh, since uh, this uh, met method is defined inside the base module, which you can think it's kind of Julia's brain in a way, Julia's core, then I, when I extend this method, I need to do it this way. So I, I'm extending it, I need to tell Julia explicitly, then I'm extending the function defined in the base module, in the base world. Then uh, the first part is just like it starts with this. So this is like the input output stream where it's going to print it. And then we have our plant of type of plant. So now I'm defining, I'm overloading this method and say that when the input is an object of time plant, you should print it as we want to print. And maybe uh, we want to print it so that it's uh, red if it's infected and uh, white if it's uninfected. So if plant.status is infected, so now we check if the status of the plant is infected, then we will print with a red square. Can I find it? Um, I guess it's just a field square. Field square. Um, just, uh, just copy, copy paste yeah. the symbol. Yeah. How do you write that? Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, so if it's not infected, we want to print a, a like a white square. Uh, by the way, if, uh, so that's uh, the function. And it's now- Black square. Okay, oh, oh, okay, I'm colorblind, but I didn't know my colorblindness is that bad. And now that uh, I have defined uh, the way to print it, plant, and in fact, it's the zero. Now, when I press enter, it displays, it's displayed as a white square. If I create an infected plant, it will display okay, as a black square. By the way, if it happens like it happened to me that uh, you didn't know how to type it, the symbol, you can uh, just use the uh, question mark and copy paste the symbol, and it will tell you how to type it. So it will tell you, this symbol can be typed by black medium square, apparently. And That's similar, good. the other one, you can question mark and copy paste the symbol that uh, you want to get. And that will tell you that this is white medium square. So that's a nice way to figure out how to print symbols, how to write symbols. So, okay, let's take a five minute break and come back at 38 past. Yeah. <laughs> more or less. Um, and I guess then we'll move into the control flow section. Yeah, I guess it makes sense. All right. Well, I don't know if it's all right. Should should I go or should we wait? Um. Yeah, I guess we can continue. Yeah. So okay. One minute later, we are probably two minutes late. Yeah. Okay. Let's just. Go. Okay. So, uh, next topic we will talk about is uh, how to apply functions. Uh, to multiple elements. So how to broadcast functions to a collection of elements. So uh, let's uh, start uh, with uh, a simple example. Let's create a matrix. One, two, three, four, five, six, okay? Now uh, we have this matrix. And um, suppose, uh, well, taking the absolute value maybe doesn't make much sense because they're all positive, but uh, suppose that we want to take the absolute value element wise of this matrix. If uh, you come from uh, a MATLAB background, you may be tempted to do just ups of A. Like if you have used MATLAB or Octave, that's how you would do it in MATLAB. However, it gives an error that uh, 
you cannot apply the absolute value to a matrix because mathematically it doesn't make sense. The absolute value of a matrix is not defined generally. So uh, the idea is that uh, Julia is uh, a little more conservative than MATLAB. MATLAB is very like, uh, like soft in just uh, generalizing functions to element wise. Julian doesn't do it. So if you want to apply a function element wise to a collection of elements, in general, you cannot do it by just slapping an array inside the function as you would do in MATLAB. And uh, uh, there are a few alternatives now to apply this function to all elements in a collection. The first one is uh, map, which uh, is uh, maybe uh, familiar to you if uh, you know some functional programming. The function map, what does it do? Well, let's ask Julia. It takes uh, as input a function f, a collection, and applies the function f to each element in the collection. So now if we return to our example before, map ups a, now it works. Now, well, it's not very interesting because they were all positive, but uh, let's take another example. Okay, this matrix map ups a, now it applies the absolute value to each element in the matrix. Uh, yeah, you can also give multiple co uh, co collections, in which case map will try to apply to all elements in there. So, I mean, like pairwise. So for example, if you want to sum to arrays, you have A, one, two, three, B, two, three, four, now you could just do a plus b because addition of two vectors is defined. But if you want to use map, you can do map uh, plus addition a, b, and it will compute the element wise sum of the elements. Okay. Uh, another option to do uh, to apply a function element wise is to use broadcast. So the function broadcast. Uh, this uh, behaves uh, almost like map, but there's, uh, there are a couple of uh, differences. So yeah, in a nutshell, the syntax of a broadcast is uh, very similar to map. So the first input is a function, for example, apps, and the second input is a collection. And remember, this was the A matrix. I now am broadcasting the absolute function to all elements in the array. Okay, uh, then uh, the second uh, example that we had before, we can do broadcast plus uh, AB and we'll again compute the sum element wise. However, there's uh, a small difference between map and broadcast. And let's see this uh, with uh, an example. Suppose I do map plus one and one, two, three. Okay, thank you. Yeah, now let's do these two versions map plus one and one, two, three. And the second version broadcast plus one, one, two, three. Okay, now let's run both. Now they behave differences, differently. And uh, what is the difference? Uh, the difference is that map just uh, applies element-wise the function. So this is just one element. This has three elements. So it just applies this map to this one and this one. So like, the because it starts with the first element of the first collection, then it takes the first element of the second collection, but then the first collection is already over. So there are no other elements. And so it stops with this one plus one. What the broadcast does in general, it tries to be smarter and tries to find like a, a common dimension and the broadcast the function in that dimension. So now it says that, okay, this is one object, dimension one, 
this uh, vector has a length, so it's dimension one times three in a way, like no height and the length is three. So it says, okay, there is a matching dimension because this is one times one, this is one times three in a way. And so I can apply this through the whole length of the vector. Is it clear? So uh, broadcast is uh, in general more powerful than map. And it will try to find like a common dimension of the two collections if it's called with multiple inputs and broadcast in that dimension, the function. Uh, indeed, so now if you probably noticed that the writing map plus one, one, two, three, broadcast plus one, one, two, three is pretty annoying. It's a lot of typing and we don't want to do it because we want to be short. So uh, in MATLAB, uh, sorry, in Julia, there's uh, this uh, dot notation. So dot notation, which basically means that uh, you can add a dot after a function or before if uh, it's uh, an operator to apply broadcasting. What does it mean? Uh, it means that uh, if we take the matrix example of before, okay, if we want to broadcast the absolute value to all the elements, so now we want to do a broadcast apps A. But uh, we don't want to do all that typing, so what we can do is apps dot A. And uh, this dot here after the function apps will broadcast uh, will broadcast the function to all elements in A. Uh, if uh, it's uh, an operator, uh, like symbol operator, infix operator, like plus minus uh, power, then the dot goes before. So for example, if uh, I want to repeat this example, so I want to do this broadcast plus one, one, two, three. So I want to add one to all elements of the vector. I can do one dot plus one, two, three. And this will broadcast to all like elements in the vector. Uh, yeah, and, and with this we can uh, get even like uh, more complicated expressions. For example, if, uh, I don't know, we, the matrix A, we want to add one to all elements. Then uh, we want to take the absolute value, maybe. Uh, we want to, mm, I don't know, divide uh, each, well, it's defined, but we want to take the logarithm of that, for example, like this we can do it. So we can broadcast the operations multiple times, adding a lot of dots. So um, first to say, hopefully a quick question. Yeah. I, I'm not sure exactly about the answer. So is there implicit vectorization? Does it do implicit vectorization if you're running broadcast or map? Or uh, I'm not sure either. I think maybe broadcast. <laughs> Cast does. I think I'm not super I'm sure either. So because it is yeah. compiled, but yeah. if you want to be sure that it gets vectorized, then I guess use a for loop or mm. see which one is faster. Yeah. Um, I, so, uh, but yeah, there's one important point here though that um, <laughs> so in like in Julia or MATLAB or uh, so sorry in Python or MATLAB or you know uh, languages that are not compiled you want to vectorize instead of having a for loop because running a Python code is slow. So a Python for, lo for loop is slower than a vectorized version like a NumPy um, yeah. expression. That's not true in Julia. If you put a for loop in a function, yeah, it's, that's, it will be fast. Na that, that's natively fast. That's probably faster than broadcast. Mm. Um, yeah, so the, you want to use the dot syntax basically um, to make it more readable. Yeah. Um, 
uh, actually I said, I said it's probably faster, but I would assume that it's inlining the broadcast operation. So if it's in a function, it's probably the same. Mm. I mean, there are also yes. tricks to make for loops faster in general. Yeah? So if yeah. you use all the ACs in your sleeves, you can make for loops faster. So also, actually, uh, in a, a software I'm maintaining, I a little like experimenting with this broadcast map, and it seemed that generally for the operations that I were doing, we, which indeed like broadcasting like functions to matrices, uh, map was faster sometimes. It was like uh, qu quite faster, like uh, not 100% speed up, but still a significant speed up like the map um, compared to the broadcast. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But that's just empirical based on like I mean, when- Broadcast is doing more complicated things.